Association in London and the City University of New York, obtaining bachelor's degrees in fine arts and architecture and a master of urban planning in urban design. She also spent five months at Paolo Soleri's Arcosanti in Arizona and six years at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York which served, among other things, as the conduit through which the ideas of the European neo-rationalists came to North America. While there, Deborah produced with Kenneth Frampton a monograph on neo-rationalist Rob Creer. Deborah has practiced architecture in Florida, Washington, DC, and now heads her own New York firm, one among the paltry 4.3% of all architectural firms headed by women. She has taught at the University of Miami, the University of Maryland, RISD, and is currently Associate Professor of Architecture at Yale University. I first learned of Deborah Burke and her architecture in the mid-80s through her early work at Seaside, the neo-traditional Florida community master-planned by Elizabeth Plater Zyberg and Andres Stuani. Having written my dissertation on a neo-traditional new town in France, I was intrigued by this American version, which was, like the French one, heavily influenced by the European neo-rationalist Leon Creer, now consultant to Prince Charles, who has not only commissioned Creer to design four new towns in England, but has also been recommending reforms for the entire European community derived from Creer's theories. What clearly emerged from Deborah's numerous contributions to Seaside including 17 houses, a food market, and a shopping arcade, was a boldness and an integrity, wrought from a fresh and original combination of color, proportion, massing, and detail, that managed to recall, recall familiar features of the home and respect the design code without becoming glib or overly sentimental, the sorry fate of so much building in these neo-traditional communities. Then in 1988, I clipped a New York Times article on Deborah's factory-built modular houses, impressed once again by her boldness and integrity, but this time manifest as a sense of social responsibility, a demonstrated conviction that affordable housing made from mass-produced components is not just worthy of attention from designers, but holds great promise for resolving the contemporary crisis in the architectural profession, for keeping architecture relevant in a rapidly changing world a conviction that good architecture need not be an inside joke or even double-coded, but accessible to and benefiting the greatest number possible. Since then, Deborah's career has flourished, bringing her an unending stream of commissions for which she has been widely recognized in publications and by numerous awards, including the Honor Award from Southern Living Magazine and the Award for Excellence in Planning and Design from Architectural Record. Most recently, she has become the architect of choice for a bevy of 40-something successful artists and intellectuals who appreciate her refined art of subtlety and understatement. I finally had the pleasure of meeting Deborah earlier this year in New York in preparation for an unorthodox group monograph of young architects who are, to paraphrase Robert Frost, taking the path less trodden and making all the difference. The next great architecture novel, the, successful, the successor to Ayn Rand's Fountainhead, might feature a protagonist inspired by Deborah, a female late 20th century antidote to Howard Rourke, an architect who is not dogmatic but for whom listening and collaboration is central to her creation, an architect who aspires not to the architectural object or machines for living, but to an architecture which challenges the positivism and paternalism of the Western canon, in part by giving voice to people for whom a voice has been denied. An architecture which is inspired not by an effort to break with the past, to master nature, and to engineer society, but to engage and to nurture our past, the site, and the larger community of users, creating a sense of place which allows for growth and change in an increasingly transnational world. Let us welcome our speaker for this evening, Deborah Burke.
They told me I have to stick my face really close to this, which is odd. Okay, not close enough. <laughs> okay. uh, thanks, Nan. And uh, it's very nice to be here. And I must say, uh, also slightly intimidating. And you should know that the the kind of the aura of SciArc uh, looms large on the East Coast. So um, got a lot of high fives on my way out of New York. Good luck, break a leg, don't be too nervous. Um, what do I do to get the first two? After that, I'll be on a roll. I'll do it. Help. Um, the first thing that I'd like to say, and this is a general comment, not about the slides on the wall, is that to me, architecture is a collaborative process, and that all of the projects that I'm going to show tonight were done with the help and contribution of others, including my former partner, Carrie McWhorter, good friend and lovely architect, and all of the wonderful people who have worked for me over the years, and many good clients, and insightful and tolerant contractors. Um, I say that in part because as a, a feminist, I believe that acknowledging collaboration and giving credit uh, generously is a step towards breaking down the myth of the architect as hero or the architect as a man of singular vision. So I want to say that at the outset. Now let me see if I can figure out these things. Uh, where do I point them? <laughs> Okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to say is that I'm primarily interested in building. Um, I wish in a way that I were confident enough to just stand up here and click through 40 odd built projects and say that the work speaks for itself and therefore I don't have to say anything. I'm not quite that confident. Um, however, I do believe that it is the building that conveys meaning, so I'm only going to show complete built projects, uh, not on the way projects, not competitions, not work on the boards. I guess I'm still not holding them down long enough. Lift them and hold it for a long time, right? One at a time. Now I've really blown it. Hmm. I apologize for this. Uh, I'll master these by the end of the lecture. Um, I started building freestanding buildings, and maybe I should actually really try to master this and go back a slide on each side. Um, I started building freestanding buildings in Seaside, Florida in 1983, as uh, Nan indicated. Um, Seaside is probably the world's second most widely published subdivision after Levittown. And for those of you who know it at all, you'll understand immediately why I've chosen to illustrate some of the work I've done there uh, in black and white slides. It's riotously and hideously colorful. Um, I've spent the past five years trying to distance myself from the Seaside legacy, but in all honesty, in terms of my career, Seaside was actually very good to me. Uh, it was an opportunity to learn how to build buildings, which as a young architect in New York City is a very difficult thing to get the opportunity to do. Got it. The one building I did at Seaside that I am going to show tonight is the Modica Market Building. Uh, Seaside's first and only supermarket, and uh, possibly America's only supermarket with conference room facilities in the back. Um, it's located on the main square in Seaside. If you're familiar with the plan of Seaside, there it is. Um, and the, s the southernmost 24 inches of the Modica market have been widely pub publicized uh, because it's next door to Steve Hull's building at Seaside, Dreamland Heights, which you see looming over it uh, in the slide on this side. Um, the plan is a little odd. It was a pie-shaped lot where the Seaside Square turns the corner, 
and the odd program of conference room, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the plan, and then the L-shaped space, which is the remainder of the space, is, is the grocery store, um, contribute to I, what I would describe as a rather awkward plan. Uh, the composition of both the front and the rear facades was very carefully considered. This is the front um, where the dimensions of the arcade in both plan and section were uh, determined by um, the Seaside Code as established by uh, Liz and Andreas. Um, but the code didn't establish in this part of town at least the choice of materials. And this was a very, very low budget building uh, built for roughly $40 a square foot and the choice of materials was dictated both by the budget and my interest in ordinary stuff. Um, this is the arcade at the front of the building where the corrugated galvanized um, awnings are cantilevered backwards from the galvanized columns that march around the front. Uh, the meeting room is an acoustically correct space as per the owner's requirements since he envisioned having Vince Scully come lecture and string quartets come and play. It's now rented by like the North Florida Accountants Society for their quarterly meetings. But um, in any event, the character of the space has, it was developed through uh, exposing the ductwork, exposing the trusses, um, exposing the various materials that the building was made out of. Having walked around this building very briefly, I realize that's no great insight here, but it was a great insight there. Uh, this is one of the materials used for cladding uh, the conference room. It's called Alpro. It's a corrugated galvanized perforated material, which is good for sound absorption. And you can see it. It's the upper part of the uh, conference room walls above the plywood. Uh, the skylights themselves in both the conference room and the um, supermarket are actually cheap aluminum windows. I spend a lot of time pouring through the suites catalog and the Thomas's register. Um, and this compositional strategy of everyday stuff, I guess what I feel, and the drawers at the office are filled with mountains and mountains and mountains of yellow tracing paper because I think when basically you're composing with drain pipes and aluminum windows, it takes a lot of work to make it come out right. So I show you these slides on behalf of an argument for drawing. Um, these were studies for the rear of the building. It happens to be the side I like best. There were no dictates of the seaside code on the back. Um, it, I, I rather enjoy the starkness of this elevation and the, the deadpan composition of the windows, the downspouts, the light bulbs, and the exhaust fan from the supermarket kitchen. The next project I'd like to show is a New York City project called Industria Super Studio. It's a renovation of an old automobile repair garage in a West Village neighborhood just south of the Meat District. Uh, when we found the building, uh, which is a composite photo you see on the far slide. Uh, it was filled with uh, dirt, obsolete machines, a spray booth, and a sort of 1930s plywood office with uh, bad pinup calendars on the walls dating from the 30s. Uh, this photograph it, it was capturing the spirit of the place, which was actually fairly wonderful. There were two significant architectural features to the building when we found it. Uh, this is one of them, a ramp up to the second floor that led directly from the street. Um, one of the things that we, the first plan move essentially in the conception of, this uh, of how the studio would work there was to break through to the ramp from the ground floor. Let me see if I can figure out how to use this thing. Ha ha, right there. Um, so that the ramp became the primary circulation route for the entire building. This is the ground floor plan. Uh, the ramp goes up here. There's a photo studio in the back, a photo studio here on the side, a uh, cafe and the various administrative offices, set building facilities. Um, Industria Super Studio is a place where you can rent fashion photography studio space so that if 
I don't know, choose anybody. Richard Avedon decides he wants to shoot a cover, is asked to shoot a cover of Vogue. He rents a studio here and everything from the cappuccino to the hair dryers to the white paint on the walls is all billed directly to Vogue. And when he, the photo is done, he sort of brushes his hands off and walks away. It's convenient for the photographers and very lucrative for the owners. Um, this is the second floor. Uh, and. The spaces that you see here sit above the ramp. The ramp arrives in this large space. This is a big studio with a corner cyclorama. And this studio, when that folding wall is opened up, is a 6,000 square foot daylight studio with a roughly 90 foot clear span across here. It's the largest daylight photo studio in New York City. Um, and I must say, th this project generated one of the more interesting phone calls I've gotten as an architect when they were reshooting the famous Avedon photograph of Dovima and the t between the two elephants. They shot it here, and they called to find out if the point load for the elephants walking up the ramp was going to go through the floor or not. They made, they made it just fine. These are, these are some views of um, the interior of the studio. Um, and these are some views of the cycloramas, which are actually spaces where all the corners in, in the far one and the interior corner and the, and the corner between the floor and the wall and the close one um, are a three foot radius space so that there is no depth at all to the space. And when you stand in this space, you feel like you're in a blizzard and you have no idea how deep it is or where you are within it. Um, but interestingly enough, in terms of this project, they, the cycloramas themselves were about the only specifically fashion industry related design item. I'll get to what I mean by that in a minute. Um, I show these slides somewhat ironically, and this is a theme that will come up again and again, and it's something that Nan alluded to in her introduction, um, because I want to stress that uh, I was responsible for the factory part, and Fabrizio Ferri, the client, and the various people who've been photographed there over the years were responsible for the style or lifestyle part of Industria. Um, and this growing chicness of the ordinariness of this place has been both somewhat troublesome and intriguing to me. Um, when Fabrizio came to me and hired me to, to design this facility for him in New York, he owns a similar one in Milan, um, he said that he had come to me because all of the Italian architects that he had interviewed uh, this is to quote him, did too much design. Um, the doors to the studios, uh, which you see here, this is the entry door to the large daylight studio. The staircases go up to the bathrooms, which are above the ramp. Um, the doors are designed to accommodate three kinds of traffic into the space. Uh, the thin side is for people, and there are plenty of very thin people in this building. Um, the wide side alone is for the dollies loaded with photographic equipment. And when you open both sides, it's passable for a car. And this is one of the few studio buildings, second floor daylight spaces, where you can actually drive a car up to the second floor in order to photograph it. Um, the doors are painted plywood, they weigh a ton, and they are held up with these uh, industrial strap hinges that you see in the page from the Thomas's Register. Um, in the bathrooms, as elsewhere in the project, we tried to use as many off-the-peg generic items as possible uh, for their modesty, their affordability, uh, their background quality in a building that was typically filled with very foreground kind of people, and also because of their durability, because this building gets used extensively, photo shoots all day, and rent out for parties all night. Uh, in addition to sticking in the best that American Standard has to offer in the bathrooms, we designed, or I suppose more accurately, assembled most of the furniture and furnishings used in the studio. Um, for example, the makeup tables are made up of scaffolding with the addition of uh, plywood, mirror, light bulbs, and a stainless steel surface to lay out all the various tools of the makeup artist on.
One block south of Industria, um, luckily for Fabrizio, there was another garage building. And when he decided to start a line of clothing called Industria, um, he renovated this building as its showroom, uh, as a showroom. And what you see over here is the large showroom space storage across the back, another ramp going up, which serves the access to the advertising agency on the second floor, uh, office space, computer rooms, design rooms, and so on. Um, I've had a bit of a falling out with the client, so there are no photographs of the interior. And I had to send somebody incognito from my office down to Washington Street to take a photograph of the outside. Um, he owes me about $6,000, and I wouldn't take it in designer t-shirts. So that was the end of that. <laughs> Um, this, is a, this is a very simple building, and we did everything we could to kind of heighten its anonymity, uh, including re-stuccoing it and putting a very sort of neutrally bland paint color on it. It is on a rather windy and desolate corner one block from the East River, so the, the entranceway is set quite a ways back. You can sort of stand underneath the the building all along here, and that also allows room for the roll down grills to come down, which you see here, uh, and not get in the way of, of the windows, which can then be fashioned after the place is closed. Um, the advertising offices on the second floor are accessed through this side door, which also has a roll down gate in front of it and is deeply recessed from the street. Uh, I seem to have gotten on a roll through the process of doing these industria projects with working for people in the fashion industry. And I had the great good fortune to do a project for a gentleman named Fabian Barron, who is the creative de director of Harper's Bazaar and the designer of the CK1 fragrance bottle and just about every other underwear and fragrance campaign you can think of right now. And Fabian rented space uh, that nobody else would take on the top of a midtown Manhattan office building. Uh, one of the reasons nobody would take it is that it only had windows onto an air shaft. And at the time that he looked at it, um, the skylights were covered over. So it was fairly dank and oddly configured L-shaped space, which at the time was cut into a tiny warren of offices. I don't even know if this plan is legible, but essentially you walk into this very long space which has absolutely no purpose. Uh, these are the windows into the light shaft. There's a conference room, a private office, and the atelier room with the various sort of supply rooms and bathrooms behind it. Um, the pro this project, in all honesty, was much less about uh, using everyday things than about stripping a space absolutely bare and using as, as few things as possible, period. Um, so maybe less about economy and just a little bit more about an economy of means. And perhaps in one of the more uh, perverse moves to make less even less less, uh, we hid the only windows uh, behind this scrim down the side of the space. Um, the scrim is made out of uh, objects from the boatyards up on City Island and theater scrim, which comes in 12 foot wide sheets. So we were able to cover that entire wall and sort of prevent you from looking out in any direction except at the skylights and up at the sky. This is uh, a sudden and jarring leap. Um, perhaps not so much from the sublime to the ridiculous as from the understated to the aggrandizing or my personal mission to stamp out the worst aspects of the self-aggrandizing and suburban subdivision development. A limited mission, but one that I had decided to take on. Um, it also brings us back to residential work, which is where I want this talk to go. In 1991, I was asked by the National Association of Home Builders to design the model home for their annual convention. Uh, this is a convention that is attended by 60,000 home builders. Um, and I was going to have the opportunity to design a house that could conceivably have been walked through by 10,000 home builders. And I thought, yes, 
here is my chance to preach to the audience I've never had any access to. Um, there are only a couple of hitches in the grand scenario of this. Um, one was that the client was actually a committee that included uh, builder magazine editor, uh, the heads of the various major construction industry suppliers like Moen and American Standard and Braun. Uh, and the committee included the builder, who was a successful developer of William Bur Williamsburg-esque subdivisions, a very successful de developer, excuse me, in and around the Atlanta area. Um, and the deal was that he would build this house in one of his subdivisions. All of the products involved in the construction of the house would be donated, and after the convention was over, in, addi in addition to the great glory accorded him, he would have the chance to sell it. He also, because of that, had total veto power. Um, I'll just fess up right away. This one's mine, and that one isn't. And this was typical of what he built. Um, and there are many hair-raising and horrible stories, which I won't bore you with tonight. But these drawings show some early studies we did of what we felt was wrong with what he was doing. But it gives you a sense of what the subdivision was like. The lots were tiny, 60 feet wide and 90 feet deep, and one of the initial things that we protested was putting the garages right on the street because there was almost no street left at that point. Um, one of the things that I agreed to in taking on the project was that uh, we would be a, a good neighbor and that we would try to work with Mr. Plummer, uh, indeed his name, the, the, the builder. And um, that deal was that we would, be a, we would try to be good neighbors. We would make a house that was made out of brick. It would fit in on the street. And I had hoped naively that um, perhaps a little bit of adventure in the elevations, uh, sort of a daring strike for the forces of asymmetry, um, wouldn't be such a bad thing. And so these were the kind of design studies we were presenting at the early meetings uh, with, with this committee of clients. What I could in no way anticipate uh, in my mission to educate the home builders of America was that I would get something in the mail that looked like this. And if you can read the printing on it, um, Mr. Plummer and all of the secretaries and um, job crew captains and so on in his office glued one of their elevations to our plan and then proceeded to mark up the plan. And Essentially what he said about the outrageous, as you could tell from the previous drawings, uh, and revolutionary facade that we were proposing was that it was unacceptable and it was going to bring down property values on his street to the point where he wasn't going to take the risk of building it. Um, we decided not to walk away from the job and to hang on to a very few ideas. Um, and I've begun to think in now the long practice of architecture with many clients that if you can get through to substantial completion with one idea intact, you have achieved greatness. Um, so there were, there were three ideas that we wanted to have come through intact in this building. Uh, they are not exactly earth-shattering or particularly revolutionary, uh, but they were ideas nonetheless and ideas that we hoped that the builders would take home with them to influence the crap that they were building all over the rest of America. Um, one, one idea was that the garage, especially on a tiny lot, should be a, a detached building. Uh, people could manage to get their groceries from their car into their kitchen when it was raining without it being the end of the world. Uh, but that by detaching the garage, you could also use it as a site planning device to define areas on a, on a tiny lot that needed some way to establish a degree of privacy. Uh, the second idea was um, a bit more subtle, and it was that the building should be much more explicit about the way it was made, which is to say, this house and none of the houses on this street are actually brick buildings. It is not the brick that is holding up the roof. It's a brick skin around a wooden frame. And uh, the brick stops before it hits the roof. And there are various pattern making games played with the brick in order to say, let's just not take this brick stuff so damn seriously. 
um, an attempt at a, at a bit of honesty in an otherwise fairly uh, it's a dishonest subdivision, because this is now Williamsburg. And the third was that, and perhaps most importantly in the hearts of architects, was that the plan actually be a diagram that had some meaning about the way people would live in the house. Um, and that, that diagram that was up on the wall next to Dick Plummer's comments uh, on the plan was the diagram of the meaning that this plan attempted to have, which is that, uh, this is the second floor and the first floor, that the front of the house pretended to sort of bear witness to the way we used to live or the way we believe we'd like to still live uh, in America, but we don't. So that's a vestigial dining room and a vestigial living room, which they call the parlor on the plans, and that they're elevated and cozy and furnished with traditional furniture. Um, and this is sort of a knockoff of a center hall colonial plan, which sells very well in Atlanta, but this building is just a little over 30 feet wide. And then you move through the back, you step down, and you're in a big room that is kitchen, fireplace, humongo TV, uh, and is on grade with the backyard, so it all sort of slips out. And the bay window off of the kitchen is actually set up as a kind of monitoring point to see who's coming in and out of the driveway. Um, on the second floor, uh, the bedrooms in front are somewhat vestigial. The suite for the owners of the house is enormous and has a deck and has a huge luxurious bathroom. Uh, and there is space above the garage, which can either be home office or a place for a teenager, a, pa a parent, or a rental income, somebody else to live. Um, I'll walk you through this house a little bit. Um, these are details at the wind, uh, around the front entry windows and a view down the driveway to the detached garage at the rear. This is the back of the house where the brick gives way to more siding. The siding here is actually masonite. Um, and, and the rear facade is itself much more expressive of what's going on inside than the front facade is. Uh, here's the interior of the bay window, both upstairs and down. I did not decorate this house, merely designed it. Um, so I take no responsibility for most of what goes on here. Um, and this is the inside of that sunroom and then the wall for TV and fireplace, which is essentially made up out of um, oddly assembled kitchen cabinets, uh, the lesson being anybody can afford cabinetry if you buy them from Home Depot. Um, but this project taught me a very interesting lesson about off the peg stuff, dis despite these attempts with the kitchen cabinets um, and the other elements. And, um, and part of it was that all of the major manufacturers in their process of donating items they don't want to be known as those that make off the peg stuff, no matter how off the peg it is. So the American standard sink that I wanted to put in this house came from the very, very back of their institutional supplies catalog and is something they use in prisons and is a beautifully sort of asymmetrical thing with just enough space on the side to put your toothbrush. And American standard insisted on donating to the project their new raspberry parfait bathroom suite complete with the sort of pinstriping around the side of the sink. Um, and I wanted to use white American Olean tile, which I think is a beautiful product, and American Olean was only willing to donate their new tone metallic series, which comes in a sort of running bond layout on the, on the pad. So it felt at, at a certain point that, uh, I suppose much in the way of blue jeans, that ordinary stuff is becoming actually a specialty item. It was a daunting experience, and to cap it all off, the other reason to go into this, of course, was to get plenty of publicity. And the day this house opened, uh, Bush bombed Iraq, and any chance I had of being in the newspaper was obliterated by those headlines. Uh, a slightly more sympathetic client was a gentleman named Peter Halley, a New York City artist who has a house up in Columbia County, which is about two and a half hours uh, north of the city. Uh, it's not a particularly distinguished house, and what you see here is the house and some of the outbuildings on the property. 
excuse me, I won't stray from the microphone. Um, but the house had a certain integrity and a lot of charm. Uh, Peter Halley achieved uh, a fair amount of recognition in the 1980s. He wrote about the art and American culture scene, and he also did a lot of paintings. He shows at Sonnabend, and he was known as one of the Neo Geo painters uh, of the 80s. Uh, and he, he wasn't so great at reading plans, but he was an excellent critic of elevations, I must say. Um, his site, you can fill in that gap. <laughs> His site is about 100 acres, most of it very wooded and steep, and where the, how, the existing house right here sits somewhat at the bottom of a hill which rises way up that way. And the idea, a after having looked at this house, was that the addition that he required couldn't be added onto the house. The house, for all its funkiness, had a certain integrity that just defied you sticking something onto it. So, this existing row of trees made a logical connection to a site on a sloping hillside against a meadow with a stone wall that the addition would be connected to the house by the row of trees across the lawn south of the decaying orchard, and that would be the right place to add onto this house. Uh, the house essentially has three primary components, uh, and, and that was the program as well as the eventual design statement. Um, the first was that it have a studio. Part of the problem with the original house, which in certain places was early 18th century, was that it had no room bigger than 12 feet in any one direction, and probably no ceiling higher than seven feet. Um, so they needed a big room, a room for Peter to paint in and a room where they could have Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, secondly, they needed guest quarters because the, the original house wasn't big enough to have a guest, any place for guests to sleep. And thirdly, they needed a screen porch, which is not indigenous at all to the area, which is a very poor area, but um, Carolyn Stewart, Peter's Halley's wife, originally is from the south, and she felt that a screen porch was a key aspect of life, and she needed to have one. Um, so what we did was essentially take those three programmatic requirements and make each one of them a building. Um, the, let me see if I can actually pull this off. This is the entry elevation of, of the studio building and it is roughly opposite the elevation that it slightly resembles, which I showed you earlier. Uh, this back wing is what we call uh, the hen house and that is the guest room. And then here's the screen porch and these photos not screened and it also has a playroom for the children above it. Uh, the client was extremely interested in and articulate about architecture, and one of the attempts in this house was to wed the building to its site. Uh, these were some of the <laughs> really impressive thoughts that went into that process. Uh, one of the other points of this building that it was that in the making of the three distinct volumes, that each volume would indeed be distinct, but detailed in such a way that that would perhaps be invisible to all but the most discerning. Um, what you see here is the studio building and the sheet of construction documents which shows how the wall of this building is made and how the windows are set into that wall. And on this particular wall, the wall is quite thick, and the shingles actually wrap into the recess where, where the window sits. And to give you some sense of scale, these windows are about eight and a half feet tall. Uh, the porch building was essentially treated in the opposite way, so that uh, the windows, rather than being deeply set into the shingles, are surface mounted relative to the sing shingles and there's a funny proportional game going on where the floor of the attic is actually down here but the sense of the porch is up to there, kind of like having your ankles show when you wear pants. And then the hen house is actually clad in vertical siding and the windows are taut relative to its, its surface and also scribed taut relative to the foundation and structure 
of the building. And I think one thing that this building has in common with Industria, which was being built at, this, at the exact same time, is that both clients were actually very interested in the, what I would call the virtual in invisibility of the hand of the architect, or at least the invisibility of the hand of the architect to the uninitiated. Um, and I think this is not so much to claim that there was no architect, but to actually function on the dual plane of only those who know what to look for know what to see, and on the other plane, which is if you don't know what to see, then there's just a sort of innocuousness and almost invisibility and anonymity to the structure. Um, I, pref I prefer actually to think of that in some ways as a potential for accessibility to the uninitiated, but I'll get to that later because it was actually something that Peter Halley and I didn't necessarily agree about. Um, I know it's, I'm somewhat uncomfortable reading to you during a lecture, but Peter Halley actually wrote an essay about this building for an as yet unpublished um, edition of Perspecta. And I'd like to just read parts of it to you very quickly because it, it sets up this argument that I'm trying to make about the everyday. Um, he says, the work of Burke and McWhorter in many ways takes up where the utopian impulses of the Bauhaus era ended. Their work does not mock the utopian era as did so much postmodernism, nor significantly does it sink into unconsciousness reductivist simulation of the effects of the historical or the vernacular as did much architecture of the last decade. Even though their work addresses the same kind of enlightened elite as did the experimentalist movements at the beginning of this century, a very different set of concerns is articulated for this very same subclass at the century's end. First, their work is almost invisible as architecture except to the practiced eye. Rather than aggrandize, it makes invisible. Rather than provoke, it only lets the initiated in on its agenda. Here then we have an architecture for an intelligentsia that is no longer willing to challenge mass culture or deterministic power, but rather wants to hide its agenda from them. Here we have an architecture for a class that does not want to announce its own empowerment or prestige, but wants to blend in almost the architectural equivalent of William Burroughs' banker's suit. Subtly and ideologically, rather than as a simple visual strategy, this architecture then advances the program of decentering of culture and power first proposed by Derrida and thought a quarter of a century ago. Here, cultural power recamps into a state of self-reflection and existential relativism. The possession of power no longer enables a bold or decisive challenge to the cultural status quo, nor does power here any longer look to history for affirmation or substantiation. Rather, history becomes a subject for study and reflection. How history itself is defined is, becomes transformed. For Burke and McWhorter, history is no longer predicated on the great themes of Western culture, but rather by a kind of Annalise spirit as a history of the everyday. Bear with me one more sentence. I think there may be one more slide to take you through. Um, the everyday, whether or not architecture itself can break its ideological shackles, thoughts on architecture can certainly try. I would propose to connect the work of Burke and McWhorter to a kind of pop American wonder in the everyday. This is a sensibility that has found expression in our era more in literature than in architecture. It finds wonders in the Greyhound bus station in Allen Ginsberg or dawn on the deserted streets of Gentilly and Walker Percy. That's the end of the quote from Peter Halley. Um, I found Peter Halley's quote uh, article, uh, from which that was a quote, both interesting and distressing because um, I've always actually prided myself on the accessibility of my work not on, and did not see it as an elitist gesture or any particular interest in an elitist camp. That essay was written in 1983, and as Nan uh, intimated, Peter was also remarkably prescient, as we are now doing work for some members of the cultural elite uh, who indeed want to be anonymous, and the house in the far slide is for Carolyn Kennedy and her head husband at Schlossberg. The, house, the models closer to me are for a millionaire horse-owning widow in Kentucky who sold the big house and wanted to live above the garage. No joke. Um, uh, 
Perhaps the extreme of this phenomenon to date in my uh, practice uh, is the Liebler House, which is a large, but not nearly so large as most of its neighbors, uh, house in a very exclusive subdivision uh, of 10 acre and up lots in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is already a rather exclusive part of America where the people are white and the lawns are green and everything is picture perfect. Um, although the site for this house was very large, um, very little of it was buildable. There, there's a big rock outcropping on this side, a smaller rock outcropping down here, and everything beyond this stone wall is wetlands and everything over here is wetlands. So of the 11 acres, roughly an acre and a half in here was buildable land. Um, so the house became a large bar, that, a long bar that stretched between the two rock outcroppings, one over here and one nestled in here, with the rooms sort of marching along it uh, with the owner's bedrooms here, a family room on terrace level here, and the gar I finally got to do the garage I'd been waiting my entire professional life to do, where one car drives in this way and one car drives in that way. Fabulous. Um, I, I really do think when you practice for a while, the pleasures are, are small. <laughs> um, The, the idea in this house was to keep it simple, and once again, although the cost of the materials was vastly greater than any of my previous projects had ever been, uh, to use the most basic elements like downspouts and window placements uh, to compose this uh, clabbered facade. And once again, on the inside, I had really very little to do with the furnishings, but there's the, an idea of volumetric simplicity, which I think is consistent in all of my work. Some other views of the ground floor. And this is the uh, side overlooking the wetlands and the meadow. Uh, the Lieblers gave me the opportunity, both philosophically, but also indeed financially, and in that there was enough fee in this to free up a little bit of time. Uh, to consider more seriously the issues of the ordinary and the everyday. And through my teaching and through these and other projects, I've had a chance to work a little bit on um, what, what these ideas are specifically. Uh, recently, with two Yale colleagues, I've been working on an issue of any, uh, you know, Peter Eisenman's publication out of New York, uh, we're a slightly unusual subject matter for that. Uh, it's an issue on the everyday, and uh, for that issue I've been working on an essay. I am not a writer, um, I will hesitate to add, but I am a very well-practiced list maker, and what follows is the list that consists, that makes the majority of my essay. Um, my list of the everyday, I'm now reading from the essay, starts below. It rambles, it is discontinuous, it is not, does not so much conclude as include. Through it I will define perhaps not the everyday, but my everyday, and speculate on what the architecture of the everyday might be. Um, it is generic and anonymous, much like the box of tissues in the supermarket with the black letters on white cardboard that does not say Kleenex. The generic does not reveal its maker, it is pointedly neutral. The everyday is anonymous, it can lurk, loiter, slip beneath the surface and beyond control, it has no signature. Authorless and orphan-like, the everyday makes no chest-beating statement, no look ma what I made, no I at all. Unfortunately, my work is not suited for the vulgar and the visceral, and Steve Harris wouldn't lend me a slide. Um, but the everyday, I do believe, is vulgar and visceral. Uh, good taste is the mechanism by which uh, the consumption of approved objects is encouraged. The vulgar rejects good taste and all of the decorum that it demands. The everyday is visceral. It is more tactile than visual and as such resists the incessant demands of look at me objects and buildings. This is totally illustrated with my work. If I had more time, I would have gathered slides from my buddies. Um, the everyday is uninventive, is crude. There is no one to impress, no impression to make. The everyday is crude without polish, rough, but definitely rough and ready. This is asphalt roofing. 
The everyday is common. It is not distinguished by being extraordinary nor by attempting to fake or substitute for the extraordinary. It is banal. The everyday is dumb, as in not speaking, which is to say that it does not tell you what to think and you get to provide your own meaning. The everyday is sensual. In addition to sight, it addresses taste, touch, hearing, and smell. The architecture of the everyday includes places known by their aroma, surfaces recognizable to the touch, positions established by echo and reverberation, like this room. <laughs> Uh, an architecture of the everyday is blunt, direct, and unselfconscious. Uh, this is a public restroom in the Florida Panhandle that I designed many years ago. Unlike most politics, it is political, inherently and inevitably so. An architecture of the everyday is not so much invisible as it is elusive. It celebrates the ordinary by defying market trends. In an architecture of the everyday, domestic life is acknowledged. There is poetry in the dumb repetition of familiar things, and habit is not confused with ritual. An architecture of the everyday does not deny the need for monuments, but asserts that every building should not be a monument, and in fact asks, what are all the monuments for anyway? I'm actually doing work for Calvin Klein, so I'm now on dangerous ground. An architecture of the everyday resists the clawing winsomeness of the most recent debasement of the truly vernacular into an architecture of false icons of another time. An architecture of the everyday may currently be fashionable, but as fashion, it is continually consumed and continually replaced, and its replacement is unpredictable and unexpected. The next everyday cannot be discovered through focus groups and market analysis. This is a study I did for Randall's Island in New York, which pointedly did not make a master plan. The architecture of the everyday is site-specific. The architecture of the everyday must be built. In an architecture of the everyday, program contributes meaning and function is a criterion to satisfy rather than a style to emulate. In an architecture of the everyday, there is space as well as object, and the site includes the precinct. In an architecture of the everyday, contiguities offer opportunities. I will cease quoting from myself at this point. Um, I'd like to end this lecture. I'm sure you're all relieved. I certainly am. It's midnight, my time. Um, on a project that is most definitely, in my mind, the everyday, this is a small house in Seagrove Beach, Florida, built for about $72,000 on a tiny lot. Um, it has columns on the ground floor that are irregular to allow a parking space and columns on the upper floor that are regular because why not? Um, it has a very carefully placed electrical meter. It has aluminum sliding glass doors, something which are a no-no in Seaside. I think many everyday and inexpensive objects are inordinately improved with repetition. Um, the house is clad in vinyl siding and masonite siding. And with all, I feel like these photographs were taken by a guy from the FBI, but anyway. <laughs> Even he said that in the everyday, uh, proportion could still be elegant and the light could still be sublime. Thank you very much. They told me upstairs that people might want to ask questions but it's okay if you don't. <laughs> uh, I was responsible up until they painted the walls purple. I had nothing to do with that. My falling out with the client occurred about halfway through the making of the interior space. Have you been there? Yeah. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> That's it? Great.
Thank you.